but um, like I said, before we before we finish, thanks very much for sticking around today. It's been really, um, I guess, a much lower key relaxed day than yesterday, which was which was good. Um, so the way this is going to run, each of the teams, so we've got a running order here, so it's going to give us a quick um, show and tell of their product, service, thing, prototype, whatever you want to do, what you call it. We'll kick off first with uh, Highways Route Rating, which is the change that's happened to Snapply for a Route Rating 2.0. And then we'll get Busyness to uh, talk us through what they're doing. The little car counter, so we've got down, double down, and um, it's still here. It's highly in plain sight, but that's good. Um, Team RAC Foundation, we need a better tape name for that. That's, that's good. It does what it says on the tin. And then, is it free, what's it, or is it transport currency? Um, uh, it's both. Right, fantastic. <laughs> I think we've called the freight on the unnamed magic parcel service. The magic parcel service. Unnamed magic parcel service. Right, okay. right, great. So, first up, it's John uh, Mitch with Highways Route Bakes. Okay, well, we don't know where it's gone. Uh, it's so, um, kind of the premise behind our Highways Route Rater was to bring in a number of other factors uh, to choosing a route other than journey time. Um, so when you search from Google, you present sort of a number of options and it will tell you just the journey time. So we wanted to bring in, um, try and get some measures and some different factors of um, different things that people might be interested in and might want to choose their journey time. So, um, for the purpose of this, so this is the very first working um, highway route greater, we picked the journey between uh, Leeds and Halifax, so that's yeah, quite local. Um, you can see sort of the, the screenshot there from Google, so what you get is a sort of choice of options. You've got the blue one, which is generally the fastest, um, and then there's the, the, the you can see here, there's a great sort of route game shape. So there's the two routes we've analysed. Um, do you want to take everyone to the uh, factors? Yeah. Just, um, just to say, ignore the top grey one, because we don't think it's a red one. But we did start thinking about it after discussing later, I was trying to put a red capacity in on that. So, what we did was run some kind of indexes. So, what actually was quite fascinating for us was trying to see what they were available and how we could get in. So, we've got the, the premise is at the bottom you have your usual type of distance which you get a store. And then you can rate different factors based on your level of importance. So we have a, a journey time factor, a safety factor, air quality, um, presence of services, um, reliability, and ease of driving. So I'm going to go quick down what you see from the tool, and I'm going to talk a bit about the data sources because I think that's quite interesting as well. So in, in this case, we've got, um, because the cars go up to five, so this is our person that's quite keen on. By the liability means of driving, but if you change the factors, the scores change. So, what we found was because um, the services we scored quite highly, um, if there were services present or not. So, if somebody selected that the service is very interesting, very much weighted towards the, the route that had services on it. So for example, if we had another route as well that included services, it would kind of, that metric would kind of be disregarded because they both have services and it would kind of choose between the two routes that had um, services present uh, based on the other factors. Um, so for example, if we've got if uh, a route of low air quality and ease of driving is important to someone, then you would score the others quite low. Um, they would score those high and you can see the, the scores change on the bottom and it would tell you to take um, the route that doesn't quite lead you onto that, but the route with the highest score is by 8644. So if you wanted to have those two factors as your most important, it would kind of lead you onto picking that route other than um, via a 58, which is actually the quickest one. So, um, yeah, can you talk a bit on two guys of count? Yeah. So uh, just a little bit about how we came up with that data, how we scored it. Yeah, yeah what we found actually was that a lot of this, the actual data is quite, a lot of it's quite available, and it's 
on both sides. But it's generally presented in a very visual form or on maps, so it's quite difficult to actually extract and view. Um, so one of the things we were trying to do for safety was we were trying to cut the accident rate, for instance. And we can get such limited data, but that um, is generally located. Uh, it's generally its way point, not perhaps the uh, route, so trying to see if it's a good route. We did then try to use a very kindly provided local data set which had the, the number of accidents on the different routes on Paladin and there was um, locally, but we still didn't have to count for it. So this bike here basically is just us counting up all the accidents we saw and then we give an average to prevent the story. Um, for air quality, there's a, uh, there's a website, different by the website, which has an air quality index. Again, it's very visual. Between one and ten, so because uh, we're not something to do, it's quite good. So if it's doing one and twos, but again, difficult to extract. Services, um, you may have heard of that being heard from Jason earlier from us about it, but we don't think there's any official information on where all the services are, so we found it from this kind of crowdsourced map. Uh, and then for the reliability information, we took sort of the, the highest of the drilling time for ability. Uh, results to be link and, and ways to address them. Um, the, the easy driving one is again some of these things, the, the concepts are there, but actually the detail of how you find the index are pretty pretty good subject to discuss them with some personal preference. So what we thought for, for our demo for easy driving was we, we took the idea that if it's on the motorway, it's pretty really easy to drive if you're a way or a single carriage way. But it's actually also in our example it's quite interesting because the site longer one goes more on the motorway and there's a place on better roads, but sinks slightly, this takes slightly longer because it's a longer distance. For each of our weightings, we typically just took them as a percentage score for the base, for the weighting in, and a lot of them we went with the idea of trying to give it the like, best one, give it 100%, and then we we'll take a difference from it to try and throw in the different um, dictators and values. Yeah, so they, they, they all kind of contribute to the, uh, the final model. Um, there's obviously a lot of intelligence you can factor into uh, some of those if you have a lot more time to develop it. Um, we were thinking about trying to include some kind of scenic uh, factor as well. We couldn't quite find any data on that to kind of pacify the roads. Although we kind of considered at least the Halifax was not the, you know, I've never driven that route myself, but some are saying it's not very scenic, so uh, okay, then we'll begin both to it. Yeah, I think that's a good Excellent, thanks very much. Just before we give you a round of applause, um, have you got any, anyone got any questions?
you're standing, I think Open Street Map has a, a scenic key in your line, but I don't think it's very well used. Fantastic. Right, so round of applause. Excellent, so busyness, over to you. Uh, 
what we can then do is actually, so if we've decided that we are having seen the data and planned our journey accordingly, we actually want to go at 12 o'clock on Thursday. If we click 12 o'clock on Thursday, it will actually give us some information contextual to that uh, day and time. Um, so here, for example, we're taking a cup of the weather, and we might, might be a bit colder, so we might want to take a coat, uh, and it will actually tell us about the kind of delays, uh, break that information on the network. Similarly, if you want to kind of drill into our route on the left on the right side, if we click the map, and say we want to kind of try and examine where specifically um, the delays might be arising. So if we here look at London, we can actually click on the node for London, and we have to show us um, the delay for that particular node. And we can see it's the N25, there's delays everywhere, I'm trying to work as I can. Um, with regards to the data behind this, what we actually did, we took some of the, the data in um, the Highways England model, uh, sorry, the Highways from the Highways England website, um, and we actually applied some machine learning to it. So in order to see if we could actually predict the average speed um, that cars would be travelling on a specific node at a specific time. Uh, we were able to do that to within five miles an hour with a 75% degree of accuracy, and which isn't too bad for a hackathon. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of stuff that was kind of going in behind it, and obviously this is being presented to the user, giving them access to that kind of level of information um, seamlessly and effectively. Um, so looking at moving forward as well, we've mocked up an app um, design, so you can look at the home screen, you can then, uh, you can then log in and the details, you can also see the functionality of the app that we've designed, um, including the heat map, um, and then you can also plug in when your usual journeys are and sign up for notifications as well, and you can also forward that onto other people. And then you would get that notification and it would prompt you to the app to look at an alternative reward to launch time as well. Sorry, you'll be sick. So in terms of what makes it special, um, there's a lot of journey planning apps out there um, and that kind of thing. However, um, there's three things you can identify that as a make quite unique. And the first is we're actually to focus our solution on user roles, um, not the kind of box standard journey planner approach. We're actually, we've got three different kind of products, and we've one in particular tailored towards people who don't actually like using journey planners. Uh, secondly, we've actually delivered a streamlined user experience. Um, a really good example I always like to point to when expressing the importance of user experience. Um, who here uses like books of train online? And does anyone here use the train online app? Now, there's, and when you think about it logically, there's absolutely no reason to use the train like that because it, they add on their own little fee for using their app. And what people do, because they have such a good user experience, they make it so easy for their customers to buy tickets. Contrast that with different national rail inquiries where you have to go to at least two websites to get displayed with a myriad of different options. Um, you don't really know what, what's going on, whether it's the cheapest option or whatever. Um, so that's the user experience we deliver. Uh, the last thing is um, we actually use machine learning on how using the data. Um, I've really quite, I've started to quite like a lot of the data to really granular, it's really well formatted, um, and there's a lot that we can actually do with that. So, ideas are taken things further. Um, we definitely want to expand machine learning, um, we want to increase the accuracy of it, so 75% so is good, but we can do better. Um, more data variety, so things like maybe incorporating road safety data, uh, events, and the weather. Um, looking at the data volume, we've only, we've only kind of touched, very much touched the surface of what's available from how in We'd love the opportunity for us to do some more work there. Um, and looking at the delay severity, so if you looked at the actual app that we've designed, it said you're, you're going to be, there's a 41% chance you'll be delayed. Um, how be better to say there's a 41% chance you'll be delayed, but an actual 5 percent chance that you'll be delayed for over an hour. Um, secondly, we want to create a platform, um, so that's delivering a better user experience based on user feedback. Um, gathering data, so the users interact with the platform, we can actually gather that data and use it to influence um, the future development. Uh, lastly, considering more user roles for things like accessibility and so on. And yeah, that's us, so thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. Um, are there any questions? Can you show us the machine learning code? Have you got that? If you really want to see it, yes. It'll take me a minute or two to see it. Everyone's, that's, that's the question about what people want. <laughs> so what do you use? I use Python. Um, does anyone use Python? It's the best thing in the world, I love it. Um, it's most, yeah, it's really, really good. It makes machine learning really simple. Um, oh, it's there. There we go. 
I actually have a rule whenever I do a pitch, which is I don't show my code. Um, because I don't think people generally want to see it. Uh, but I'm quite happy to do this. I'll try and see a bit. It's not like it, it sounds very obscure, but obviously you may able to do it fairly quickly. So yeah, we, what we're doing here um, is we're just spending 40 minutes later. Now the dev, as I was saying to some people earlier, the dev, whenever you do something like this, the actual form of machine learning is easy. So this bit is actually machine learning here. So what we're doing is we're building um, a, a train test model where we actually keep us, we, we build the model with 75% of the data and we keep the remaining 25% to one side so we can actually test how effective our model is. And then here it comes back up. We can see if you see there, that says 75.17. So that's how accurate the model is. Um, everything up here is the cleaning of the data, um, getting the data in the right formats so that we can give it to this sort of machine learning algorithm and we get it up in here. So that's things like we can't machine learn, it doesn't like things like uh, flows of decimals it has to be introduced, and we have to um, convert it instead of having a date, we actually have to convert it to so it's the day number of this year. So January the 1st is uh, well, January the 2nd is the 2nd, February the 1st is the 32nd, and so on. I mean, instead of time, you have you have to you derive the minutes after midnight um, instead of having like, like 15 minutes past 12, all of which is a massive ball lake. Um, it took hours um, for a time to have to kind of do this bit, which was the easy bit. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot, that's brilliant. Cool. Okay, uh, so we set out to create a simple traffic monitoring system that anybody can use in the local area. So on the left, you can see the feed from the webcam that we just stuck out here over open the window, looking down on the arches underneath. And it's just a simple, cheap webcam. And from this, uh, we created this system. So it's able to pick up moving objects, in this case cars. And if you see the line at the top of the screen, so it's able to monitor when that object passes the line. And you can see that in the top right corner is the number of cars that pass. I think this has been on for about an hour now. And from that, uh, we can get a number of measurements uh, and then send it to the Amazon web server, which I think is set up. And this is essentially like a live dashboard feed of the traffic down there. And we can get a number of parameters out. Uh, so you can see this is the variation in traffic with time. And we can actually see how the traffic signals vary. So all peaks where the lights are on green and everything's passing through in this direction. And then lower amounts when people are just turning left. And we're also able to estimate the type of vehicle from the size of the box. So a larger box might indicate a larger vehicle, or a bus or a lorry, go down to perhaps a medium-sized object. So this is a pie chart showing the majority of traffic passing through uh, of the medium size, uh, probably cars, and then smaller objects, so cars and bikes, make up a much smaller proportion. And we also had to go at estimating the speed of the um, objects of the cars as they pass through the line. So we're getting about an average speed of about uh, 20 miles per hour. So the eventual aim is to port this to a mobile application. At the moment, it's just functioning on the desktop. And when it's ported to mobile, anybody can set up their mobile device looking across at their local street, perhaps. The use case might be they feel that traffic's moving too fast along their street or too many lorries are moving along in their local area. So using this system, they can then monitor it over time and get an accurate picture of what's actually happening. And then the aim is to make all this data open so people can examine different areas around the country if they have any traffic concerns. So you can see it's been running for about an hour now, there's been about 1,000 cars been sent to the server. Just a new question? No, but before the question, you should say. Yeah. It should really be fucking picking that up as a new yeah. object. Yeah. Oh. Think about it. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So that's what it should have. So if you had passed that line, it would have got sent to the server. So all the service designers were talking about design lines uh, for that morning. So we put five, six lanes of traffic that someone just walked across. And you put, I, 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 
took up four, four or five years an hour to do that. There are many. Yeah. Which is because there's no crossing on that side of the road. Yeah, yeah. So there's no crossing on the side of the road. Yeah. 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 The council is looking to change that route to the part of the slightly steep highway scheme. So there's a draft that I'll talk about for that. Excellent. Uh, any questions? So I've got a question. What's the hardest thing doing that? Um, or the most? Probably getting the, 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 the desktop application to send the actual data to the actual web server. That's but all the image. Uh, recognition is quite well documented. It's, it's, it's got all open source. Um, what, what, what's the number of boxes? Uh, so it's got a number attached to it. Oh yeah, that's just the uh, total number of objects that it's been looking at. So, okay. uh, and then it's obviously because it fills the down to the actual number in the top right. So it, oh, is that even if a box appears, it doesn't cross the line? Yeah, that's it. So say, yeah, look, a fuzz goes across here. Yeah. It would pick it up as a marked object, but it wouldn't pass it if it's gone across the okay. desired spot. Cool. Just out of curiosity, you've got a bus that's gone past uh, like three or four boxes. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, how are you doing that? Uh, well, I guess if we have more time, we go on to threshold, look at the actual image processing algorithms. And algorithms. So it's looking at the contrast of the object, so picking. So similarly coloured objects, um, areas would get picked out as one object, whereas a bus, the long row of windows that are darker than the outside might get picked up as another object. So at the moment it's kind of counting. Yeah, that's, that's an issue at the moment, but I think it could be tweaked and that sort of thing could be negated. Yep. I've got two questions. Well, well first, I think this is really, really good. Um, really good. Um, and secondly, how much background did you have in using the geolibrary before today? So uh, how did it take uh, it's, it's really well documented, so only about an afternoon. Okay. So it's okay. got okay. tutorials out there. I'm completely using this for an example. Do you think if you had more time, you could do things like try to segregate different categories of vehicles or add in speeds? Yeah, well, we've got sort of a rudimentary speed calculation here, but you'd need some way of translating sort of pixel size to the actual. Distance in meters to track the object. But it, it, it's something that's possible. It's yeah, possible. yeah, I'm sure it is possible. At the moment, we're just looking at the change in, in pixel between different frames that the object's moved through. Could you, if you had a view, could you actually like different directions? Yeah, I'm sure that would, so you could have, um, not uh, limited by just having a single transition point. So if you had a number, you, you could track the object. And see which is put the area up into zones yeah. and then see the path through there. Mm -hmm. I assume you've just got two lanes of traffic as well, traveling in different directions, so you'd be able to nail which object. Yeah, at the moment we've just got it set up for bottom to top transitions, but yeah, you could have to easily set it up. We could also look at what lanes and the number of traffic for each of these layers as well. So we gave you a little preview of this one earlier, so we pretty much say the same except for adding a color to it. Yeah, so this is based on our um, pay for fuel data, which we keep on Google Drive. Um, so like at the top we have the retail price today, which is in fact yesterday, uh, petrol and diesel, um, and then the arrows indicate whether it's up relative to last week or down relative to last week, and it's the same for the wholesale price, which is what I call the flats price, which is if you would buy um, a one load of petrol, how much it would cost uh, uh, And then we have the proportion of tax that is um, Proportion of uh, retail cost that is taxed and the proportion of diesel cost that is taxed, and these scales are the historic minimum and the historic maximum. So once it hits the once it uh, hits the top, the top extends along, and then we have uh, diesel petrol whole, retail and then diesel petrol uh, wholesale over time. So that's the first basis, and this is all done in um, flexed downwards in our market. So um, to split the work up, we've um, 
just made different dashboards and propose all the same. We get back to the office and ask for some money for a computer screen and actually think about the, uh, the layout. We'll, we'll combine the, uh, a lot of them, but at the moment it's in, in bits. So that's the first one. So we originally set out Office 6 to make eight, well, time inspired against us. We managed to make five, but the rest of the dashboards we're about to show you is basically particularly on open data. XML feed 
for um, what they call unplanned events, and then it, it essentially divides up the text, because it's sort of human readable uh, uh, news alerts, divides up the text and isolates the time delay phrase in each of the statements, and then turns those into numbers and adds them up. I'm not entirely pleased with how it handles delays of more than an hour, but luckily there aren't really that many significant delays of more than an hour at the moment. So that needs some refinement. But that's the sum of the delay in each event currently on the network. So that changes. It was, it and was then, a lot higher earlier. It was a lot higher earlier. Up so 300 minutes? Yeah, so it goes above 200 minutes, which is an admittedly arbitrary number. Um, it, it turns sort of reddish. But uh, we weren't sure what, what number we should set it at. But the back end of that is much more interesting than the front end. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, the back end to this dashboard is also more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the actual dashboard itself. But it, it, you know, it gives us a really, really reassuring, perhaps, uh, statement <laughs> saying zero mile time of flood risk. But what this dashboard set out to do is to have a look at the length of road which is under flood and flood risk. Pretty much said it for itself. Um, and we used um, open map roads to fall roads, and we found on the environmental agency's uh, website a map of uh, a sort of shape file of where they give warnings for flood. Um, and we can feed that in as an API, which is done, and that obviously updates every 15 minutes. And what we've done is we've calculated the number of the length of road within those flood risk areas and every 15 minutes uh, when the environmental agency, environmental agency API updates it will calculate how many miles are under flood risk. Well, right now we're zero and throughout the day it's been zero. Uh, <laughs> perhaps when it rains it might go up but that will be the true test. But it does work, we put it to work um, Again, the the back end of this was was much more interesting and much more time consuming because we set up um, some GIS work and it literally took all day to run. It only finished running about 20 minutes ago. So yeah, that's our pieces of our dashboard. The idea is to add a couple of bit more and then we'll have one big data policy dashboard all to promote the use of open data. Fantastic. This dashboard, uh, we'll be putting it on the web so anyone can show it anywhere. Oh, uh, we, I, I, I have to check. I, I would love to, yeah. but, but it's one of those things that I have to check. That wouldn't be great if you had your foyer and the foyer. Um, yeah, foyer I mean, the, the original basis of this is that I went to visit ORR, and I don't know if anyone who's been to ORR, but so it's that? the Office of Road and Rail, which oh, used okay. to be the Office of Rail Regulation. So everything is kitted out with like train stuff. Like there are pictures of trains and, and it's all very training. Um, <laughs> and, and there's and there's these, these boards that are filled with like train information. And then it became the Office of Rail and Road, and someone has clearly gone, oh god, we need to get some road stuff quickly. So they turned off one of the screens and they replaced it with one of those really bland images of the motorway, you know, with the light trail, you know, sort of like background end of the PowerPoint presentation type thing. Well, that's not what they should really be after because they should be thinking as much about rail as they should be thinking about road. So yeah. that's the original basis. Yeah. Well, next time I'm in there, I'll give them to the top England on there because that's at least a bit more dynamic. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, this was early days, but it was just a bit, well, it was a bit sad. Yeah. But yeah, there's lots of sort of training type of stuff in that building. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. most of this is based off open data, yeah. you know, full fits of it at least, so you know, you should be able to... Right. Uh, any other questions? No? Oh, yeah. What tools have you used to put this together? Uh, it's um, the Flex, da Flex dashboard package in R, um, and then uh, the uh, working out the miles of road that were in flood risk. Uh, the underlying work is in QGIS, but that's only in one. That's only once, yeah. and then that file is used in R. So it's all, it's all R. Excellent.
Any other questions? Just an observation really I was thinking that the delay index and frame the flood one that obviously the one challenge would be to try and take the number of minutes of delay and the likely number of vehicles affected. Oh yeah, 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 that would be that's that was that was like that. Yeah, they, this isn't gonna be the final draft. <laughs> it's gonna go back in and add some yeah. Add some things in. Because this is our work process. Right? Yeah, so we, we used open map roads, but we've got um, a shed file at work that we paid for this. The average annual daily flow, uh, uh, map frame with average daily flow, which we could then do the same thing and then sum the, the, yeah. the vehicle miles travel. Yeah. Um, that that's, that's doable, but we just we literally have like five minutes left. It's a mix of SRM data and all road data. So Our response to that is the public don't know the difference, nor should they have to care. Can't they? But how complicated would it be to make it all road data for all your dashboard measures? Oh, it's, it, it's easier to do all road data. Yeah. It's, it's, the, the, it's simpler to do all rather than SRM. Um, with the exception of the, the, um, the delay. Um, the others are all far simpler to do everything rather than SRM. Yeah. Uh, the other, the, 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 yeah. It, the SRM delay one is the only one that really has to be SRM specific, and the others, the, the idea of slicing by SRM only is, is harder rather than that. But it's still doable. It's doable, yeah. It's still doable. A bit more work. A bit more work. No more questions? Fantastic. Great ability of service. Um, this is the unnamed magic parcel service because we never came up with a name. So, I am going to demonstrate how to work. I have a parcel set up. Now, there's a thing with parcels and freight. Um, there's a lot of them on new space in cars. So, this is Martin's car. Um, we take a typical car, BW Golf. It's got about 1.5 cubic metres behind the front seats. Typical occupancy is about 1.6 people, so typically that space is there. Uh, if we take that to be about 320 kilos, which is about 83 people in the back and as much again as the boot space, that can carry, if you multiply that up by the number of passenger kilometres that there is, the number of car kilometres there is, uh, that comes up to 120 billion ton kilometres a year, which is equivalent to all freight movements in articulated bodies. It's a lot. Right. But anyway, so, who wants to receive parcel? I will. Good. <laughs> so, I've got a parcel sent to you, and I am going to go on the website and say, where it's going from and to, uh, and what its weight and size are. That gets slapped on there as a label. So, website goes, hello service providers, we've got this. Back end of the website goes, there are all these services. So, uh, there is something called Truck Space, which does this particularly for large lorry loads. Uh, it can go to, there, there are ride sharing services available for long distance travel like blah blah car, um, which could potentially carry um, parcels and packets, or it could go to DHL and TNT. Some people who are going anyway, for example, to deliver something that they've also got to install. Um, all sorts of things like that, data comes back. So, what's going to happen is then Someone who's going gets a message. Hello, please can you take this? We pay something and also some credits that we're going to get onto later. Oh, sorry. Uh, so then he comes and picks it up. Oh, look, I've generated uh, weight data. <laughs> <laughs> Then to a local collection point. Yeah. 
foi pro Flamengo. Hey, hello, see that your pal says that local guy can point from which you can collect it at your leisure. Don't forget the crowdsourcing of local collection points. I'm not an Airbnb for storerooms. So, um, that's basically that. I'm on it. I'm getting it. Oh, I'm Thank you. 
that that's, that's basically works as a cryptocurrency um, through um, whole coin as an example. Um, yeah, what we uh, wondered, there was a lot of sort of naysaying about this initially because, um, because trying to convince organisations to, to buy into this and also to be able to handle fine grain data in very sort of small scale transactions. Um, one method we thought would be to um, introduce a cryptocurrency um, and sort of introduce some liquidity, perhaps under the control of, of, of uh, uh, transport body, and um, therefore the ability to acquire units and, um, and exchange them the other end for sort of free buy uh, uh, free public transport travel uh, and so on. It just provides some pretty uh, useful policy levers and, like, um, and control of, of the flow of some value so that um, policies can be, can be uh, modified over time and tested indeed. Um, so we thought perhaps use something like um, a whole coin moving forward. So it's clearly not uh, rocket science or neurosurgery. Thanks very much. So we've got free mobility as a service, cryptocurrency, unnamed magic parcel service. <laughs> <laughs>